This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today I am deeply honored to be speaking with a very special guest, Dr. Peter Levine. Peter, thank you so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. Yeah, I'm I'm gladly. I'm so happy that we could make this happen, and I'm really excited to talk to you about your work, your new book, and your just your journey. So, um. Let's start off with, if you will, you telling our audience a little more about who you are and what you do. Okay. Well, um, uh, I'm the develop Peter Levine. I'm the developer of somatic experiencing, uh, which is a mind body, uh, neurobiologically based, naturalistic uh, based uh, approach to um, trauma and and to accumulated stress. Um, I, let me just tell you quickly where my journey began. When I started developing my work in the late sixties and and seventies, uh, I guess you could say I was fortunate because the definition of trauma as PTSD was still another 12, 13 years, uh, in the, in the advance. And so I didn't know that trauma was a disorder of the mind, the brain, and even a, 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 even a, a sometimes said to be a disease that could only be treated or managed with uh, with helping people change their thoughts and and using medications and so forth. And by the way, I'm not against medications uh, temporarily. It's a, sometimes it can be helpful, but anyhow, it's certainly not the solution or a solution. So uh, so when I started working with people and they would start experiencing very powerful sensations in their bodies. Mm -hmm. And these sensations, you know, a twisting of the gut, uh, the fast beating of the heart and and so forth. And then as I kind of pursued this, it became clear that these were due to traumatic events, what we'd call traumatic events. But I, I want to make something clear at the beginning. Somatic experiencing is not about getting the trauma or getting the trauma out or reliving the trauma. It's definitely not about that. But to change how it it becomes stuck in the body. So instead of feeling gut wrench, we can feel an openness and spaciousness spaciousness and warmth in the belly. And then maybe to look back at the images that might be coming up or thoughts that are coming up. But the key, again, is really... The, the living, sensing, knowing body. And that's the, the term somatic experiencing, the name of the method, which means it's the experience of the living body, of the soma, not just of the anatomical, but of the living, knowing body. And um, so I then started to teach this. I tried to teach this to a group of therapists in Berkeley, Berkeley, California, and so we would meet every week or two at my, they call it my tree house in Wildcat Canyon. And I would work with people and I would try to find the language to explain what's going on. Now, one thing I want to say about somatic experiencing is that it is not a, a therapy per se, but it's an approach. It's a methodology that allows people to do what they do better, to let them to, to do what they do, how they do what they do. So in a way, it, it, it has this kind of a unique position in the therapeutic landscape. So that's basically the beginning of, of my work. And then starting from the, I, still, if people ask how many people have, have been trained in this, I think, let's say, I think it was about 12 or 15 people because my mind is still back at my treehouse. So I was <laughs> absolutely, quite frankly, <laughs> shocked to find out that it, you know, that it, um, 
uh, that uh, uh, trained, uh, how many train, people trained? I think it was something like in 44 different countries that like 50 or 60 people were, were tr uh, trained in, the, in this method. So, um, so in a way, when I started to try to teach this, um, you know, the reception, let's just say at best was lukewarm. Mm. Mm. Uh, you know, it seemed like, you know, many people were saying this could be dangerous for people to feel their bodies, and which I think was really revealing more about themselves. Uh, but that has really changed. So I felt a real burden to try to find a way to get this out in an effective way. And this went on for some years, really. And now I'm in the, so I really it was a burden that I was carrying on my shoulders. But now I realize that there are at least 50 trainers, 50 or 60 trainers uh, that are carrying the workout into the world. So I don't have that burden on me. So to the question, have I done enough? I can answer that in the affirmative. Hmm. If I try to answer the question, am I enough? Well, that's a little bit difficult. And it's, well, let's just say it's a work in progress. And in order to go in this direction, I don't know if this is maybe uh, we want to go in this direction, just let me know, um, that about three years ago, because as, you know, I'm at, at the age where I have many more years behind me than I have in front of me. I mean, even though I am a fairly uh, vital person, uh, I thought it was time really to look back at my life and how I've dealt with adversity over the many, uh, over the 50 years. And so um, I, I started working on, I guess you could call it an autobiography, but really it was, it, it was just an excavation for me of my mm -hmm. life and how the different things connected to the, in my life and many different dimensions. So, um, so I did that and it was, it was difficult, but it was, I, I don't want to say cathartic, but it, it was revelatory in a way. And, um, so, uh, a really close friend of mine who, who I shared it with, um, she said, you really should write this as a book, publish it as a, as a book. And I said, no, my God, I can't do that. It's too vulnerable. <laughs> you know, it's, and, uh, and I just left it for a while and then, thank you. And then one of the publishers that I worked with, uh, she, I don't know how he got a copy of it, but she got, got in contact with me and said, look, I think you can make this as a book, but it's not, it won't work yet. And, and he, he said, well, what's the, what would be the purpose? So I thought about that and the purpose for me would be to help facilitate other people's healings about their stories and really even encouraging them to do something like I did to really go from, you know, really excavate their lives, look at the timeline, look at different uh, ways that they've experienced adversity and dealt with it um, successfully. So, uh, so anyhow, one thing led to another and now two more years left and the book is finally now at the printer and it's called an autobiography of trauma, a healing journey. And one of the things that in, in somatic experiencing that we don't just go into the trauma to relive the trauma. I don't, I don't think that that's uh, really that helpful. So, um, so when I, the, I started the, when I wrote the book to myself with a, a violent, uh, my family was uh, under life threat from the mafia. And when I read that, I said, no, I can't expose people to something like this. It's just, just too much. And then I realized in what, if I was, uh, my therapist in somatic experiencing, what would I do? And so what came up is a couple of events, but one in particular, when I, I think I was about four years old and it was my birthday 
And my parents snuck in uh, my room maybe in the night or early in the morning, and they laid the tracks of a, of a model train, a Lionel train, under my bed, out into the room, back, and then under the, uh, then back underneath the, the bed. And so when I awoke, you can imagine <laughs> my joy, my surprise and my joy. And I felt that in, as I reflected on that, I felt that in my whole body, my whole mm-hmm. being. I jumped out of bed. I went to the transformer. I changed the speed of the train. I made it go, woo, woo. I really, I felt cared for and I felt loved. And I could feel that in my body. And so that then allowed me to, to navigate some of these horrific events that occurred, but also some revelatory uh, experiences uh, as I continued to kind of uh, scan through my life. And at one time, well, uh, I was working on my PhD in medical uh, biophysics at Berkeley and also developing the methodology and beginning to teach it. So I, I had a lot on my plate, so to speak, plate would be the operative. So there was a restaurant that I absolutely loved. It was called the Beggar's Banquet and it was on Solano. uh, No, no, it was on San Pablo Avenue. And I would go there at least once or twice a week, probably more like twice a week. And the waitresses there knew me. They would always greet me by name. Usually I started with a bowl of warm soup with some French bread that was like crispy on the outside and soft on the inside. Again, as I'm telling you the story, I cut my mouth is sort of wa- watering. And I, I do. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Sensory experience. Yeah. Okay. So, so then um, one day I was sitting down and there was a shadow off to my left and I looked up and I glanced and I saw the, an image of a, a man with unkept curly hair and wearing like a jacket, like was two sizes too big for him. And so it was all crumpled. And it took my breath away, I, you know, because I usually don't have visions. And what I'm talking about is that in one sense, I knew that this is what, what sometimes is called active imagination. Jung wrote about that. I, I've, when I did a little research on it, it says only children exhibit that. I say, no, no, that is so wrong. We all have that capacity if we invite it in. So anyhow, I recognized this person as Albert Einstein. And um, so I invited him in and we, I would then, we introduced ourselves to each other and I would ask him questions about what I was doing and developing. And he would ask me questions about my questions, kind of like the Socratic method of, and as I say, this went on for many months. And at one time, I've been uh, discovering that things that have happened to our ancestors can directly affect us. And so I asked him if he had some ideas, some guidance for me in working with this. So in the image, and more like a dream at this point, we walk together to a pond and he's holding a yardstick with a number of small stones along the yardstick. So we're right at the, by, by the pond. And so we twist it over like this and the, the stones fall to the ground. And of course you get ripples going out in all directions, not just forward, but sideways and back. And of course this is very Einsteinian, you know, the space time. And then he said, okay, so the wave front passes through each other. But what happens if when it gets stuck is that anything after that is distorted. Mm. And if this happens in several places, the whole thing gets distorted. And so our, our experience, our embodied experience is of that, that distortion. And I asked him, um, well, how to, how to work with that, how to help people heal from those kind of things. And he said, um, 
He said, I, um, Peter, I'm going to have to leave that to you. And I realize what we need to do, again, not going and reliving the trauma, but finding where things got stuck and then unsticking them enough so that they could, again, move in all directions. So, um, uh, and, and I th that was one of the last visits we had. And I was deeply sad when it was clear that, you know, that the, that encounter was, was now over. And so I let it go. I went back to my work. I continued writing my doctoral dissertation. I continued trying to teach people. I don't think I call it somatic experience until the eighties, early eighties, but, um, my, my life was occupied and I didn't think much of it then. And this to me was <laughs> one of the things that's, again, when I talk about this, I'm, I'm, I'm touched. So I need to Kate create a little space so I can be touched and tell you the rest of the story, which I, again, uh, penned in the autobiography. So, so uh, some years ago, 20, 20, 30 years ago, I was visiting my parents uh, they lived in New York and I spend the day um, and going to museums and then uh, came back. And as I walked in the door, I noticed the bookshelf and on the uh, shelf was uh, one of Einstein's books. I think it was the general theory of relativity. And so that flicked, uh, that kind of clicked the memories of my encounter with Einstein, my imaginary encounter with Einstein. And so I told that to my parents and my mother, oh, she was a difficult person, but in some ways she was quite intuitive. And so I told her about these encounters and she looked startled, but in a, in a good way. And she said, Peter, I know why this happened to you. And I thought, what, what is she talking about? She said, when, uh, uh I was, uh, it, when you were in utero with me, you, uh, I was eight months pregnant with you and your father and I were canoeing on this lake. And then a wind squall came up and tipped the canoe. And we both uh, were in the water and we couldn't right the canoe and couldn't. And so they were uh, sure to perish. Just at that moment, a, a small uh, sailboat came by and there was an old man and a young woman in the boat and they pulled my parents to safety. And they introduced themselves as Albert Einstein and his uh, stepdaughter. And at that moment, I said, mm. oh, God. Because she reasoned that in that moment of life threat, Einstein saved all of our lives. And in that way, we were bonded. We were melded together. And over my lifetime, he's at times of trouble. He's come to me and I, you know, been able to ask him questions. I don't have the image of him being there, but I, you know, it's, it's still something like that. So in a way, my life was made up of these synchronicities of these dreams, which really informed what I wanted to do, what I needed to do. Um, when I was, uh, ambivalent about making this into a book, I also had an interesting dream and I was facing into a meadow and in my hands, both hands, there was a, a, a bunch of papers and clearly there, there, there were, it, it was typewritten uh, material on it. And I was confused and I looked, you know, to the right, to the left, and I was in conflict or, or I was not knowing really what to do. In that moment, speaking of the wind, the wind came up from behind me, a breeze came up from behind me and took these pages and then scattered them along through the meadow. And then I realized at that moment that yes, I would write the book as a autobiography, that it could help people heal. And it was again, difficult to do, especially certain parts about my sexuality that were also very, very, very um, scary to write about, 
Um, but then, you know, the publishers uh, want you to get endorsements from different people. And so I got some of the most touching endorsements of people that I knew and friends, colleagues, and other people. And I knew that I was doing the right thing and that they were supporting me. And that support means something to, so much to me, so much to me. Because in some ways I had some support as a child, but in many ways I didn't have support because these were secrets that were held that the mafia was threatening to kill our whole family. So it was never talked about. My brothers and I knew something was wrong, but we didn't know what it was. And so we, didn't get the support from them because again, it was, was hidden. So. When I got the support from my friends, from my colleagues, in a way that was the support that I had been missing. Mm -hmm. I hadn't quite thought about it that way. Yeah. But that's the truth. That's my truth. Yes. And, and what you've shared is so moving. I, I was holding back tears when you told the part about the lake and I mean, barely holding them back. I don't know how much you saw of it. I was, I was like, uh, I was yeah. overcome because it was, there was so much power in that story. And it's, you know, even before what you just said about those secrets that your family yeah. was carrying, yeah. the, the thread of how what's not spoken. And I know that's some of your work is a major part of your work and what's not spoken, what's not consciously known yeah. is so still so present, Yeah, but we don't know why we feel yes. that way. And so right. it's so, it's so confusing. Yeah. So then when you're like fighting against what's also feeling so important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, uh, sometimes I get a uh, request, somebody will send me a book, you know, and I, I guess they wanted me to say some, some kind of endorsement about that. And uh, one of the books, I just happened to turn to this particular page and I read this couple of sentences there and I said, oh, that is completely right on. I, I totally agree with that. <laughs> but then I noticed they were quoting me from my book in an unspoken voice. <laughs> uh, yeah. How the yeah, body releases trauma and restores goodness. And the, the quote is something like, trauma is not so much what happened to us, but what we hold inside in our bodies in the absence of that present, connected, empathetic other. Yes. And that was really... Uh, that was really, when I thought about that in writing that book, it was revelatory to me. I had realized, yes, this is really how it should be. It's really what we need to give to our clients, give to ourselves to some degree, but to give to our clients and others and people who we're close with. So we, we're not holding this alone. Yeah. Yes. And I'm hearing, and I would, be a liar if I said I've read all of your other books, but I know of them and I, I just haven't read them because of like time. Fine. But um, <laughs> but the message I hear there is like whatever isn't being whatever, whenever there's something and there's not someone there to witness and hold it with you is that's yeah. when it has to go underground and out of your awareness. That's right. That's right. So that's really like that attachment piece that mm -hmm. you know people don't mm -hmm. always think about when they think about why people have trauma responses yeah. and yeah. resilience. And I think we know many, many uh, different researchers and so forth that it's clear that the attachment piece is so important to what we had there, that holding environment when we were 
held and loved. And, um, but that's one of the things is that's always there as a possibility. Even if it didn't happen then, it can happen later. Well, in the example I gave about waking up to the train, you know, I felt loved, uh, but I had a very difficult um, childhood around attachment. It was actually quite terrifying. But, and I think this is, I think one of the things that um, somebody wrote, some uh, f- a friend of mine, I think something like, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. Mm. And I think we can, again, come to that knowing it in ourselves. Yeah. That yes. we, we have that inner child. Actually, the last page of the book is a picture of me when I was about 18 months old. And the, the, that end chapter was called Living My Dying Through the Eye of the Needle. And I connected with that child with his, his aliveness, his vitality. I don't think healing occurs necessarily all at once, but sometimes it comes and surprises us as it did here just now. So that's my story, my mm-hmm. autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so beautiful and I have to share with you that um, back, oh, I don't know, probably around 2012, 2013, I went to a PESI program where you spoke, and this was in in Hunt Valley, Maryland, and um, it was when you were looking to bring SE to Maryland, Mm -hmm, and you were kind of trying to get um, participants to know about it so they could sign up. And sure. when I attended that, I was fascinated with every, and I was, I think I was newly clinically licensed at that time. So uh-huh. I was very fascinated with everything you shared. And I was like, I'm doing this for sure. I want to do this training. And it ended up that it just didn't come together in mm-hmm. the right timing. And I went yeah. another way. But when I heard you there, I experienced you and and what you shared the way I did. And then when fast forward to last summer, last September, when I heard you speak in Oxford at the master series with Bessel van der Kolk and Steve. Uh, Alicia Sky, Deb Dana, and yeah, C. Porges, and you, the energy that you exhibited there and the, the, the sense of you that was felt in that space the sense was so different not to say you weren't that way then I don't know how you were personally but the vulnerability and openness that you're bringing here it's so it's a gift to all of us because for one as um, a white man of your generation that's not you know uh, rugged individualism is the the message and to show vulnerability isn't exactly welcome. I know with like my dad and his people are the Stoics and you know how profoundly that's impacted me, but to have you like model that Mm -hmm. not only is it okay to acknowledge that you're a person with feelings and tenderness and vulnerability and fears and scary experiences and joy and love and connection and all of the flavors of what makes you who you are, are not only okay, but like it's a, it's a benefit to all of us for us all to know that we, that is safe to show who you are. And, and I, truly believe that it's what we must have more of in our world if it's gonna you know not go the violent way that it's going yeah or yes i'm really grateful well thanks yeah i think it's really important that we can model for our clients our own vulnerability by our own capacity to heal. You know, um, 
one of the things I talk about in the autobiography, I talk about Chiron. And Chiron comes from the Greek mythology, but it's uh, come to mean more of the wounded healer. And, um, and all of us, well, I won't say all of us, but mostly all of us have our own wounds. And that's what brings us into the work. I mean, We'd maybe- probably be quicker if we didn't, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe somebody, I don't even, I was gonna say maybe somebody who's doing cognitive behavior necessarily had trauma, but it's very likely that they also did. And uh, so, um, so that when we address our own wounding, our own inner healing, then we're much more able to be empathetic and to be present for yes. our clients. And, and, and to me, somebody says, well, how do you know that the trauma is, is over or something like that? And I say, well, when the person feels alive and real, that they feel connected to, for want of a better term, their true self, their uh, capital T and capital S, uh, that, that we manifest those attributes. Um, and again, that's to me the counter side of trauma. You know, sometimes I've asked people what I, I don't see people now, so I'm, I'm retired from that, but um, sometimes I w was working with somebody and they also had really hor horrific trauma. And when they had come to that place in themselves where they felt alive in their bodies, they felt tingling, vibration, waves of warmth and so forth. And I would ask them, I was a little tenuous at first, but I would ask them, uh, if you are the way you are right now, would you choose not to have had the trauma? And I think almost everybody, maybe, maybe everybody said, Yes, I would, I would, I would rather that I had the trauma and I'm where, uh, where I am right now. So I think again, that's the great aliveness that, that, uh, transforming trauma can bring into our bodies and into our spirit and into our souls. I cannot agree with you more. I literally was saying this. Now I'm trying to remember, was it on a podcast interview or was I just talking with someone? But I was saying just yesterday or the day before that would I take away the experiences mm -hmm. that I've been through, the painful experiences that I've been through, and then I would have to lose this like incredibly deep, rich Mm -hmm. relationship with myself that I never knew was possible. If I had to, no way. I mean, the growth and the, I don't know how else it would have, where I would have gotten to this point. And that's just, I mean, you know, you know, this very, very well. So many people who have been abused and victimized feel that they are broken and, you know, um, uh, people will call themselves monsters and just say that you, know, you don't understand, you don't know what I'm really like. If you knew who I really was, you wouldn't say these kind things to me. Yeah. And, you know, that what you're speaking about is that innate, like, power of self love and healing that's in there, even when you didn't get the attachment experiences that you needed, you know, like there's no broken. Right. You know, I, the word you said innate. Yeah. It is that we all have an innate capacity to move towards healing and wholeness. And as therapists, we're not curing our patients, at least not from my book, our patients' traumas but we're enlisting and helping them enlist um, that healing power, that force, the instinct to heal and to come to wholeness, to self. Yes. Yes. I find that so hopeful because when I know when I've been in my trauma reactions, when I've been in down and deep dark spaces where I thought that I was so, you know, hopeless, it was never going to get better that I 
I didn't know that our drive is towards wholeness, not towards just like decline and crash, you know? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, I think that's about really about the human condition. Mm -hmm. And I think we should have two choices. We either that or we go to violence, not just violence to others, but violence to ourselves. Yeah, I know. I remember telling my therapist, well, I'm nonviolent. I don't hurt other people. And he said, violence isn't only towards other people. And I was like, oh, <laughs> well, I am deeply, deeply grateful and honored that you have taken the time to share a small piece of your story and your journey with us here. And I know that the listeners will be very moved by everything you shared and inspired. So I would love for you to tell us, um, because you have like somatic experience in Institute, you have ergos, you have a lot of um, ways that in addition to your books, many, many books and this new book that you serve our world. And um, you, you say a little about that, about the, places that people can go from this point to more with your work? Oh, sure. Well, you, you can go to the somaticexperiencing.com website and a lot of that material is there. There's also a link or you can go directly to, if you're interested in uh, finding an SC-based therapist or, um, or training, you can go to uh, traumahealing.org. And that's the Somatic Experiencing International uh, uh, Training Institute. So, and then we have events like one that's coming up called the Immersion. And I think that's also mentioned, you know, talking about, you know, talking about Oxford. Um, when, when we were there, it was, um, you know, you could go to different workshops. So you had the keynote speaker. So it was me and Bessel and Steve. And, but then you could go to, you know, break out. So um, uh, Melissa actually came up with the idea and Scott Lyons from Embody Lab that we would do an immersion where every day that it would probably start with the old fogies, us, but then also <laughs> young, the younger ones. Because, I mean, I think if people ask me, you know, are you, hope, are you a hopeful person? I said, well, I'm hopeful as long as I know that the younger people are really also finding their selves. And um, so anyhow, and then there's also the opportunity. It's, I think it's streaming as well, but if you're there, it's also the opportunity to actually work with some of the SE trained therapists who'll be there. So, but anyhow, I think all of that is on that uh, somaticexperiencing.com website. I'm, right. I, don't, I don't know if I've ever seen it, but. <laughs> so it sounds like the immersion is through the Embody Lab and has other speakers too, like Correct. a set point, maybe Ariel Schwartz is maybe one of yes, the yes, ones she's who there. I love. And, and Gabor, my friend Gabor and my Beautiful. friend Bessel, Bessel van der Kolk, uh, will be there. And, and I think it'll be a, a really, a, a different kind of event. And so I don't know if I'm looking forward to doing one more thing, but I am looking forward to that. It's beautiful. I'll be sure to put a link to that in the, in the show yeah. notes because I know people will want to know. And I just want to say one more time, Peter, thank you very much for the work that you do, for what you are doing to heal our world and in a teeny tiny way for coming here to Therapy Chat today and what you're going to be yeah. sharing with our listeners. Thank you yeah. so much. Okay. And, and thank you, Laura. And walk tall, walk in beauty. <laughs> yeah. I receive. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.